Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 11th, 2023, and this is a week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. Hold off on your crypto picks and stock picks until we get to the charts. We'll do crypto first, as usual. And a couple things I want to update, mostly this week. I want to update uh, the core methodology in crypto. Two weeks ago, I think we had three or four of them trigger and all hit the IPT. And on one of them, and luckily it was the one that's still working, I wrote uh, the start of something bigger. But obviously I hoped, a word you should never use in trading, but I hope that the other two or three we're going to keep on keeping on, but I did stop out on those. Got a couple of questions this week, and I really appreciate questions. It makes my life and job a heck of a lot easier. So we'll get to those questions on entries, questions on weekly charts. And then just a brief update. So just want to talk a little bit about the zero DTE options. Too good to be true. Well, I think they are too good to be true, at least this week. And uh, we'll get to that in just one second. Just, there's a flame screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. I'll have to summon up all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Thank you to Greg for giving me that. All right. So as I just said, a couple of weeks ago, I, sure, I showed the core methodology, pullback entry, stop, initial protective, initial profit target, as we always talk about. And I had three or four of them hit the IPT. And out of those uh, three out of four or two out of three, I forget how many it was, stopped out and remained. So it didn't turn into a big deal. This one, so far, so good. This, there's the original trade. And again, I'm not betting the farm with this crypto stuff. It's, uh, it's wild and crazy. I, I'd love to up the ante on it, but it's just such a wild, it's like wild, wild west. So you got to be super careful on that. So entry was right here on a pullback we had a nice trend we had nice landry light now last week i showed some landry light pullbacks that's a great pattern to use in crypto and any other market for that matter just but you don't always need to fully define something if you're newer to trading i would recommend you do trade something like maybe textbook tkos i'll show you one of those in, in a minute or one that could be one let me think about that we'll get to it and then also something that's like easy to define like a Landry Light pullback. And then once you get a little better at trading, then you could use a little bit more discretion or more and more discretion in the patterns. And even if you're using something that's somewhat mechanical, like a Landry Light pullback, make sure you have acceleration coming into the trade. For instance, I'm just kind of seeing this for the first time. But notice that technically this was a Landry Light pullback, but notice how much steam this market lost. And one thing I, I woke up thinking about I'd like to do is I'd like to make some net net indicators just go off a of close and maybe like one day five day 10 day 15 day 20 day and keep going up to maybe even 100 days so whenever you're just a lot of times you get excited when you see a, a setup and it's a little hard sometimes to pick them apart especially especially if you're anxious to trade or put money to work everyone look at it but if you had some sort of illustrator not an indicator but an illustrator on the bottom to say you know what this crypto is at 0.0245 now on this pullback and you go all the way back a month or so and it was at that same level now it's still in an uptrend but it certainly lost a lot of momentum so i wouldn't get too excited about a setup like like this even though technically it's a landry light pullback so find something that's a little bit more mechanical a little bit more easier to qualify and to some extent quantify maybe something you could scan for and you could just have a scan that says, okay, I want X amount of days above the moving average, that's Landry Light, and then I want it to intersect the moving average and that'll that'll throw those out. Even better thing to do would just be look at a lot of charts. And that's, that's the only way you're gonna get better and better at reading charts. Anyway, the IPT was here. If I'm not using leverage in crypto, then what I'll do is I'll put it in a 20% IPT. I guess down the road and technically I should use volatility to help me place my initial profit targets. But these things are so crazy and they move so fast 
twenty percent is kind of nothing for these things. And a lot of times I'll get my IPT hits on noise alone and then come back in and get stopped out. And that's a better than the poke in the eye trade. This one so far, a little bit better than poke in the eye. So you can see a couple of weeks ago I wrote the next big thing, question mark. And our stops at break even now. It is I wrote last week. Not yet, but not doing too bad. And it's the only one that's actually working. And the, the beauty of the money management system where you're taking those partial profits and just in case the market comes back in like those other two or three did, at least you're getting something off the table. And sometimes noise alone, bigger picture noise alone, will get you, will hit the IPT and you'll end up with a profitable trade overall. Now, and we'll get to we'll get to the entries in just one second on all that. But the secrets again is that free rolling and I preach this a lot and we hadn't really had any stocks lately do this because the markets have just been abysmal and the pay, the secret to a market like that is patience. But if you can get into trades and get that free roll happening. So if this thing scratches out so what? I know I might drop an F bomb, but so what? And if it doesn't, then maybe this might turn into the next big thing. It probably won't, but it might. And you never know what the next big thing might be. And a couple of years ago, we got into a coal stock and rode it for like a year and a half. And that was the next big thing. Who would have known? I guess you need a lot of coal to fire up those plants to charge the electric cars. <laughs> but that's another story altogether. Lately, we're talking a little bit about zero DTE options. Those are options that expire on the same day. They expire every day of the week. Uh, I think they just have them on indices right now. Stuff like the E-minis, XSP, which is a cash settled instrument, which is pretty cool and kind of fun to play with. One thing I've been thinking about is like, hey, I'm having fun with these, but am I making any money? And I had one really good day which made it all worthwhile. And then it's been kind of a grind and some days not so much of a grind, sometimes getting hit fairly hard in between. So I'm still working on them and I'll let you know if I find anything that's worthwhile. Now, like I said last week, when it comes to option models, everybody in the brother has the same models. So I'm not sure what that gives you. So yeah, take a look at the IV, which is the implied volatility. And some people like to compare that to HV, which is historical volatility. So you get an apples to apples type of reading with the markets implying versus what the market what the market is showing historically. And that's how that all works. And it, it can give you an idea like, holy crap, these options are expensive. Like I saw HV in the 70s right around the Fed announcement. And it was like 60s all day or 50 something all day on some of these options. And they just went absolutely nuts to where yeah, if you look at an HV, it's at 70 on an instrument, an underlying instrument that's like 15. Chances are it's not going to pay off. So, like I said last week, can the underlying move enough between now and expiration to make it worthwhile? Now, with these zero DTE options, I've been working on gamma plays, and gamma plays have always been a bit of a fantasy for me and, and hopefully they don't remain a fantasy but it's um gamma is the rate of change of delta and all that means is that when an option gets near the money okay let's say you're out the money and it starts getting near the money all of a sudden the delta will skyrocket delta is how the option acts per let's say 100 shares okay and that's how it works in stocks so if you have an in the money option let's say you have an option at 10 and the stock's trading at 12, it'll have a delta of 100. So the stock goes to 13, up one point, then your option will go up one point. Now, if you're buying a 12 option and the market's below 12, just below 12, or maybe, maybe a point below 12 or so, all that option is premium and it has not a whole lot of delta. But as that market approaches that strike, the delta goes to 50. So an at the money option has a delta of 50. But as soon as it starts going in the money, okay, then the delta goes up to 100. So a little hard to wrap your head around that. But the bottom line is 
the price changes dramatically for near the money options and out of the money options, obviously, too, if the market really starts making a route in one direction. So IV might help on a relative basis, like if you kind of know that certain markets have a certain IV and all of a sudden they seem high to you or low to you. Now, the other day they seemed kind of low and the option prices seemed dirt cheap, but those were two days where the market had little tiny ranges and I couldn't make any money in options on those days, even though I got some free rolls off, which is my ultimate goal with these things is to, let's say I put on a couple of calls at, I don't know, uh, 30 cents each. Well, I'm going to flip out one at 60 cents to get a free ride on those. And that's what I've been kind of noodling with. And that's where it's kind of like, gee whiz, or am I actually going to make uh, money from this? But I do think the potential is there. Now, along the lines of expenses versus cheap options, this is the main point I wanted to tell you this week. Here's the way I see it, because I don't get into all the, all the weeds, the reeds, what do they call it, the reeds or whatever when it comes to the complex option models. And everybody has the same model, so I'm not sure what that's gonna, what's that, what that's gonna buy you. Maybe your stock picking or your pattern selection or tape reading in general might help you. But as far as the option models, I don't, I don't really see where the advantage could be there. Maybe if you're some engineering type and you're doing some sort of complex positions or something and you want to get in at this price and sell the high hv and buy the low hv or iv i should say you know maybe so i don't know is what i'm trying to say but one thing i thought about recently is options that seem kind of expensive to me and i kind of closed my eyes and bought them anyway and they doubled and i'm like wow look at that and like i just said on that narrow range bar day we had a couple of days ago we had two days of that I had two days in a row like an idiot, kind of the definition of insanity. I bought cheap options, but they seem they seem cheap, and they expired worthless. So expensive options that double in value were not expensive, and cheap options that expire worthless were expensive. Obviously, you lost 100% of your premium on those. So that's a, a another way to kind of wrap your head around things. I would encourage you to tread lightly on this right before I'm going live, since today was not a good day. For my options trading, I was thinking, you know, um, I didn't get killed, but I mean, I've got a bunch of, I got like two or three, I, I, most of my positions turned into free rolls, but I still lost money, you know? So it's got me thinking like, I don't want to be like the Judas goat and lead you into this stuff, but I just want to explore it and see what's there and kind of noodle with it. And keep in mind, I'm doing this in a fairly, fairly small, uh, small manner. If you're newer to trading and you haven't mastered the swing to intermediate term trading and then possibly IPOs and things like that, then I would encourage you not to venture into this market. I was rereading Linda Rasky's sardines, uh, trading sardines the other day and watched a couple of videos from her. You always get something good out of Linda. She's awesome. And anyway, uh, in the in the book, she was talking about the um, – where was I going with that? Um, Oh, uh, whenever you, that's, I'm trying to think of an eloquent way of saying it, but whenever you try a new method or a new market, it seems like, according to Linda, and it, it makes sense, I'm like, aha, no kidding, Linda, that's what I'm seeing right now, is whenever you move into new methods or new markets, that seems to be where your losses will come from. And I guess that if you had 20 or 30 years of experience doing a certain type of thing, then you know what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And that's one thing I was thinking about lately is with some of this option stuff at all, I, I don't have a definitive plan at all times. With the core methodology, I do. What's frustrating over the past, oh, it's been six months, eight months or so with the core methodology, which is completely normal because I've lived through these cycles before. But what's frustrating is nothing's following through for the most part. And we haven't caught that elusive outlier that makes it all worthwhile. And I did use the word elusive on purpose. Anyway, so uh, tread lightly with these things. Is, I think it's the best thing I could probably tell you when it comes to options. If you're watching this on YouTube and you get something out of me and my videos, like it. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. Half kidding. <laughs> Subscribe while you're here. Also, become a gold member at DaveLander.com, and you can unlock premium courses over time, and there's uh, there's a bunch of stuff to keep you busy for a long, long time. And we have the Facebook group, which I love you guys and girls. All right, so I solicited requests 
and I got a couple today. I want to thank you guys for that. Brian says, do you ever trade off the weekly chart? If so, how is it different? If not, why not? Okay, good question. So the first answer is, the answer is yes and no. But the first answer is yes. So something like the TFM 10% system is based on a weekly chart. I wanted a somewhat longer term trend following model, and I wanted to prove that one, it could work, and two, I wanted it to be really simple. And that's why we use a weekly chart is for the longer term. And we had one bar of Landry light, two bars of Landry light. You need two bars of Landry light above the 50 simple. Plus you have to close within 10% of the 50 week closing high, okay? And I have that illustrated on the chart right here in green. So if you take this high here, that was the last closing high or the highest closing high for 2022 and you come down here, this line will be 10% below that line. This is all in the ACP plugin. If you, all you have to do to get the video, to get the plugin, if if you have ACP, I can't help you with that. But if you hit this, if you hit like, and then hit the plugin down here, you'll get the plugin for free, at least for now. One day I'll charge for it. Right now it's free. So get it while it lasts. So anyway, I had this system trigger in the queues, and I, I, Knew it was getting close to a trigger, so I did a little back testing by hand, and I just got a, a written letter from somebody asking me about some help with some system design and stuff. And I would encourage him before he wanted me to program, and before you start programming or anything, test it as much as possible by hand. So anyway, I went back and tested this by hand. It looked to be fairly robust in the queues, so I thought I would give it a shot just for S and Gs. So I bought 100 queues based on this system. And my entry is 319.49. It's too early to start kissing each other just yet, but it's almost seven points in the money. So that's better than the poke in the eye. Check back often. Now, just real quick, in my nightly analysis, and I have, I think these are 34 inch monitors, one, two, I have five 34 inch monitors. I got one big monitor that I'm not using. And, um, but the, the, the monitors, if you divide these 34 inch monitors in two, I think you get the equivalent of two, like it used to be a regular size mon monitor back in the day, like 19 inch or whatever they are. So I divide my monitor into two. I use this little software, if you can see this little thing right there called Display Fusion. And it's really, really cool if you've got big monitors and you're working with them. I have a huge monitor that I uh, just can't figure out where to put it or what to do with it. But that Display Fusion works really, really good with it. And it works good. I've got four monitors hooked on one computer over here. Actually, just three right now. I got a fourth one that I'm going to put in. But anyway, it works really great because you could, you could just end up with all these different kind of full-size screens within your bigger monitors. Anyway, not to digress too far, but the point I'm trying to make is I've got a full kind of computer screen on one of these, or the daily, and then I got a full computer screen on the longer term daily. I put as much data as I can over here, and I look at three to six months over here. I'm kind of in and out on the chart when I'm doing my analysis. When I'm doing my scans, I go through those really, really quick, and I'm not going in and out too much, and I just flag anything that's remotely interesting. But if I do see something, let's say I see, let's say I saw this as a short, okay? And if I looked over here, I'm like, you know, this thing is just coming off of these major lows, almost all time lows, right? I don't want to, I'm not really excited about going out and shorting it. So I'll pass on something like that. Now, obviously in a case like this, it's like, okay, this riot's doing pretty good. And it's pulled back a little bit. And back then the crypto was doing much better than it's doing now. And we'll get to that in just one second. So when I look to the right, I'm like, okay, we got a little overhead supply, but that's about 60 or 70% away. And then we got some more issues over here, but that's two or 300% away. So at the time, I thought it looked pretty darn good. In fact, it still looks pretty good. If you wanted to take this trade, I think an entry above 13 or right at 13 would probably be a good, uh, a good entry for that. It's kind of a trend pivot pullback. So I'm still kind of bullish on this because I'm not stopped out, but one day at a time, let's just see how it all shakes out. But anyway, 
when I'm doing my analysis, I'm looking at a long-term daily chart. Now, I used to keep this on weekly over here just to give me bigger, longer-term perspective or whatever. But for some reason, I just kind of like the way the daily looks so I could see that overhead supply a little bit more clearly. So I use a daily chart for that. But there's nothing wrong with using like a weekly chart just to kind of give you a feel for where you are longer term. Now, you have to be careful due to lag. And I'll talk about that in just one second. So speaking of which, here we go. So if we go back to the pandemic, we had a bow tie to the downside. And we had a sell short at this level here. Now, by the way, the way the weekly sets up with the TFM 10% system, you don't have a tremendous amount of lag from what I've seen so far, at least on the downside to get you out. And that was one of the designer's intents, the Ian McActive B diaper change, as he calls them, was to avoid those diaper change moments, something like this 30% drop here from the signal in the pandemic. Now it came right back, but we didn't know, obviously, it would come right back. Now, when you take a look at the weekly chart, it bow tied here, and by the time it bow tied, you can see the bow tie down here. It was already too late. Okay, green means uptrend proper water, and uh, excuse me, I had to eat something really quick right before I got started. And uh, red means downtrend proper water, and yellow means somewhere in between. So you could see on a weekly chart it was too late. Now, do look at your weekly charts, okay? But do your timing off of uh, your daily charts. And the reason I wanted to show you this particular transition is especially if you look at individual stocks, by the time you get around to getting that weekly bow tie setting up on an individual stock, then the move might be over like it was back here during the pandemic. Okay. So that's one thing to think about with the weekly. Now, the bottom line is patterns or fractal, which would works in one time frames works in others. And it's probably a good idea to put that weekly chart behind you if it's a, a good looking, uh, if you could somehow see, oh, okay, well, we're in a really long-term trend in the weekly and this is happening on a daily and it's good that the weekly backs you up. Now, patterns are fractal. So the bow ties, if you take a look at the bow ties going back to the bear market that began around 2000, you could see it bow tied at fairly high levels because the market sort of gradually rolled over. You know, the market rollovers never feel gradually when you're in them. But if you look here, it's like this market just went bumped along, bumped along. It made marginal, it made all time highs here, sorry. And then it just kind of went choppy, 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 choppy sideways. And then kind of almost stealthily, you could see that bow, it bow tied. And then you got your sell short. There, I need to look to see. Maybe it was, it might have bow tied a little bit earlier. Could have given you a little bit earlier signal, but it it worked in this particular case. Now, if you go back to the 2007 2008 bear market, same sort of action, kind of a slow, gradual rollover. And as I've said ad nauseum, way back in October, markets making brand new highs, and I couldn't find a long to save my life. So I started showing shorts. And we were short pretty heavily going into that bear market. And so the bow tie set up here, you can see at fairly high levels. And then obviously, we all know what happened after that, after the bubble burst in 2000. All right, any questions on weekly versus daily? I do like um, keeping an eye on those weeklies. I mean, if we get a weekly, like let's say the overall market, like in 2000 and 2000, and sh was it? 2000 and 2007, 2007, 2008, when you see a weekly bow tie to the downside, you better pay attention, okay? And there's nothing wrong with trading off the weekly chart, but you're going to have a lot of lag. I would prefer reserving that for something like longer term market timing, like I'm doing this uh, experiment with the Qs in the, um, whatchamacallit, uh, with the TFM 10% system. Okay, Ed asks, are there different type of triggers? Uh, for the core methodology, no. The only thing that would be different 
would be a market on close for something like an IPO. So the buy it B pattern, if you go to my YouTube channel at Dave Landry is my handle and search for the buy it B pattern, you'll see some of those. And you could also find them on my website, DaveLandry.com. So that would be the only different type of trigger. That would be a market on close order. But as far as triggers in general, I'll walk you through those in just one second. When we have a new setup, what is the trigger or types of triggers that could make us a buyer? Okay, I'll walk through that. It's, it's just, it's, it's only one trigger, but it depends on where you place that trigger. Maybe you, can, maybe you could explain with regards to the newest setup. I ran out of time tonight, but I'll, I'll throw in the setup next week. I had the entry just above the high of one of the wide range bars, if memory serves, and I'm gonna walk you through that with a generic example here in one second. And that's because if it, if it comes all the way back, I think that it's a viable candidate. If it drops and doesn't trigger, then you just want to sit on your hands and then find another setup. And that'll make sense too. I know it's all in the books, but it's a lot to absorb by reading. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that I, I learned early on um, when I was working with Jeff Cooper you know, I read his books and I did the programming and stuff. And uh, there's a gap between the book and and not just his book, any book, you know, my books too, I guess, between that and the, the reality of trading. And that's why I developed the courses. And that's why when I do these webinars, I'm trying to connect the dots and show real trades and show what I did and express my frustrations, uh, which might be coming out a little tonight, and things like that on things on that nature. Because there is a gap between, I would say, the 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 book and the actual trading, any book on trading and actual trading. And it's uh, I guess the the saying is the map is not the territory. Okay. So I hear you on that. No problem with the. And thanks for asking. Actually, uh, thank you. Great job on stock charts. Can't wait to the next installment of Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. I read that book. But you make it come to life. Cheers. Yeah, there's so much good stuff in that book. And I'm kind of doing it in a way from a selfish standpoint. It's sort of forcing me to go through all this stuff. And then in the process, now I'm rereading his biography. And then I'm going to read um, How to Trade Stocks, which is which is his book. And uh and see what I can see what I can get from from that to kind of fill in the holes with the reminiscence and everything else. And uh, he was a uh, he was an interesting individual. He didn't always walk on water, but um, we'll save that for those shows. But thank you. I'm glad you liked those, you know, because somebody on a YouTube comment, some guy said it was mumbo jumbo. <laughs> I don't know. It's funny. If you actually trade, it's like everything to me makes a lot of sense that I say. But I guess if you don't trade, maybe not. Who knows? Okay. So if you get a, a textbook TKO where you close close to the bottom of the range. You got a wide range bar, like I mentioned earlier. Then you could actually put your entry just above the high. And by the way, a lot of times you can put your stop right below the low. And the beauty of that, as I preach, if you have the entry and the stop, then you know what your initial profit target is going to be. So yes, on a wide range bar to the downside with a TKO, or it could be a TKO within like a pullback, like the setup he was asking about a minute ago. And again, I'll cover that next week. Then you can get that entry pretty close to the high. I always enter above at least a one bar high and it might be a two or three bar high, depending on the close and everything else. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. So the beauty of this pattern with the textbook TKO is you got the methodology, which is a TKO, it should be easy to recognize. You got a strong trend, you got a wide range bar down after market recently made some new highs, okay? And then you know where you're gonna enter, you know your stop's gonna be, that you know your initial profit target. And by the way, oh, somebody asked me about scans um, a couple of days ago. I don't know if I answered them or not. I saw it on my phone, but I didn't see it on the actual group. Uh, if you go to members resources, if you go to the members dashboard, there should be members resources on there, davelander.com slash members. And under member resources, I give away, I have scans for, right now I just have scans for um, Telechart. 
So I'd give those away there if you need those. Over time, I'll probably have some scans for something like stock charts. And if somebody wants to write a, um, a Landry Light pullback scan or something like that, I'll, I'll be happy to publish that too. So that's what the scans are. You might have to change the parameters and the volume because the new TC, which has been out for 10 years, I think, <laughs> reports actual volume. Now, let's say we're trading our generic pullback, okay? And the idea with the pullback, and I've gotten to a, not a heated argument, but a bit of a discussion with someone once. I think it was a, an email banter. And they were more of an engineering type. And they said that I trade reversion to the mean. And I'm like, those are fighting words, right? Well, he finally got me to admit that I trade reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend, okay? So the idea with the pullback is to first identify a fantastic setup and then have an adequate pullback enough to knock some people out, possibly attract some eager shorts. And then if the trend resumes, you could possibly take, take advantage of the predicament of these traders or investors or whoever they are. So yes, we're looking to capture reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend and hopefully, and there's that word again, but hopefully it turns into something much bigger. Now, let's say you wanna enter right above the high. The problem with that is a lot of times noise alone will trigger you in and then the stock rolls right back over. So your entry in a case like that would be too close. Now, let's say you decide, well, I'm gonna enter way up here. Well, you're gonna give up that reversion to the mean move and you're not gonna capture it, right? So you're not gonna get that bounce up. And by the time it gets all the way up here to trigger you in, and, and that's a spot, as I'll show you in one second, where a lot of times we're actually taking profits at that level, we're actually pulling off half our shares and a lot of times it, that's all we get a lot of times we get stopped out a lot of times we just get the ipt and scratch and that's okay and occasionally we catch a nice long trend but again you're not going to get your reversion to the mean move if your entry is way up towards the old high the other thing to remember too is breakouts are prone to failure now way back in the day before everybody had a pc on their desk maybe not Maybe they worked a little better. And certain times in history, like 1999, and then every now and then, every few weeks in crypto, crypto goes crazy again, you could just buy breakouts in crypto. And in 1999, you could have bought breakouts and, and made a lot of money on breakouts. Uh, the Turtles claim to fame was trading a simple breakout system, and they absolutely printed money. They did realize about a halfway through the program that they were risking way too much and it could have blown up. And I would never be shot on Friday, but a lot of turtles had difficulties afterwards, it's my understanding. And that's just because they were, you know, not to take anything away from them, but they were in the right place at the right time. And they did, they were pretty amazing in what they did. And breakouts were breaking out and following through. They were trading commodities. It was a great commodity bull market. But as a general statement, breakouts are prone to failure. I know people trade breakouts and they're, Accuracy is abysmal, but occasionally they catch a home run. Well, it kind of sounds like us lately with the core methodology. Now, sometimes, oh, getting back to the entries, you want to figure out a way where it's not so close to the market that you get triggered on just a little noise alone, but far enough away, but not so far away to where you're going to give up your reversion to the mean move. Okay. So let's say your entry is there a little bit above the price, it trigger in. And then you get your IPT out of the trade. And then, like I said a second ago, maybe it runs out of steam and comes back in. Hopefully not. There's a word again. But hopefully you at least get the IPT from the reversion to the mean moving in the direction of the trend. So you want your entry to be just about right. Now, as I said earlier, let's say you've got a wide range bar that closes poorly kind of like that textbook TKO, then you can put your enter in right above the high. Now, let's say you've got a close that looks like this. You're gonna to have to put your entry a little bit further away. 
you want the market to prove itself by triggering an entry, okay? So you need to think about where you want that entry. And then once you figure out where that entry is, you need to think about where would you be wrong, absolutely wrong. Now, if you're trading a first pullback after a base breakout, let's say you got a big fat base down here, then your stop can go somewhere just below that base because you know the pattern failed. And there's a lot, or if you're trading a transitional pattern, let's say you're shorting and it's rolling over, or a better example would be, let's say you're buying as the market's kind of coming off its lows. Well, if it goes down back down the new lows, you're wrong or even if it begins to approach those lows. So your stop is somewhere between those old lows and where you got in. So a little bit more defined in certain situations like that and in a textbook TKO. Anyway, hopefully that makes sense. If you have any more questions on that, uh, let me know now and then we can bring it up to Facebook. All right, let's jump into crypto real quick. And we'll just take a look at couple of major pairs. And if there's anything you guys want to look at in particular, I'd be happy to cover it. So like I said earlier, when crypto is blowing and going, and now is really not that time, but when it's blowing and going, you could just go in here and look at the strongest one. See, this one's up 67% today. This one's probably a little thin with the long tails and stuff, but sometimes you'll catch a break it out. And if you've got a lot of them breaking out, then it could work. Uh, quite nicely. But what I like to do when the market is running is I like to sort them by relative strength, and that's just a day over day change. It's the actual relative strength. So I know that that one's up 10%, this one's up 9%, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, let me show you the, let's take a look at the at the major ones. So here's the one, just real quick, here's the one that I'm still long, okay? So we'll see what happens there. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not looking too good right now. Bit of a bummer. Let me show you something real quick. Um, we had a 220, 230 EMA breakout back here. Bar one, one bar of Landry light, two bars of Landry light. So entry would be above this high plus a little wiggle room. In a case like this, this prior high right here, is probably what I would have used in that particular case. So that wouldn't would have would not have triggered. And in this case here, bar one, bar two, second signal, maybe give it a little bit more wiggle room. This one possibly could have triggered, but you want to give it a little bit of wiggle room when you're trading that type of system. Now I just said breakouts are prone to failure. This is a pretty cool system. It can work, can be in a keyword not sentence. It can work pretty nice in crypto. Because sometimes crypto being inefficient as a general statement, especially these uh, shiz coins, okay, can really take off. Like that one I just showed you up 67%, this one here for the day, right? So something like this, a little simple pattern can work. Like back here, bar one, bar two, entry above the high, got you in here. So that was a pretty good run off of that one. One thing that does kind of amaze me with this simple little system is, Sometimes you get signal after signal where they don't trigger, so you don't get that official breakout. So anyway, I'm a nerd, but that's kind of a cool little thing to do in breakout markets or when markets are acting in a very inefficient manner. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum down here towards its lows. It's important for these recent lows to hold in both Ethereum and Bitcoin. Let's take a look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Ethereum's a little bit stronger than Bitcoin now, and it had been weaker. It had been incredibly weaker. You can see this serious drop here, but now it's starting to firm up a little bit, and it's a little bit stronger in here. Okay, any pairs you guys want me to take a look at real quick? Let's just see what else is happening. Now, if you were to play, like, let's say, let, let me show you one that's real strong. That's not a good example. See, that looks kind of interesting. Now, see, if this didn't have the, the long tails tells me this one's kind of thin. But if it didn't have those long tails, I would be willing to buy something like this and put an IPT 20% higher. The point I was trying to make is, okay, here we go. Something that's below the 30 EMA, I wouldn't touch it even if it is up sharply, okay? You want to buy stuff as it's moving into clear air. 
All right, let's uh, shift gears and go to stocks. Once crypto heats up again, I'll have a lot more to say about that. That's all I have to say about that. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. If you want to talk about any individual stuff, I know we talk about stocks all day, but if there's any individual stocks you guys want to talk to or somebody here tonight that's not in the Facebook group, feel free to ring up uh, your favorite stock picks. So let's take a look at this market. All right, S&P 500. We're kind of stuck in a range, as you can see, shorter term and then longer term, we're behind these multiple peaks in here. Ideally, I wanna see this thing break out and not look back. It's been kind of a choppy kind of working its way higher in a slowly but surely choppy kind of way. One or two big updates would make all the difference in the world, but I sure would like to see it break out and not look back for a while. Let's take a look at all the bow tie moving averages. You can see, is that a weekly? Yeah, that's a weekly. So for those keeping score, we have uptrend proper order on a weekly. So that's a good sign. And we have uptrend proper order on the daily even though it's kind of chopping sideways in here. All right, let's get back to the major MIGs. I guess I should spend a day figuring out how the new software is different. Okay, NASDAQ Composite, look at that, multi-month high. So that's a good thing. You can't argue with that. And if we keep on keeping on, we're gonna be at one year plus highs. And in general, things are looking better for the NASDAQ on a relative basis, we're within 10% of the 50 week closing high. Actually closer to that, we're probably almost getting to 100% of the 50 week closing high. We'll be there fairly soon. So that's why we got the TFM 10% system in the queues, which is similar to the NASDAQ. But this is very encouraging, kind of a stealthy little quiet breakout here. Markets that kind of quietly improve overall tend to be better for trading than markets are just kind of blast higher and then correct right back in or whatever. So what I'm hoping for, and I've said the word hope, I know a few times tonight, half a dozen times, but I'm hoping that the market can continue to kind of grind its way higher and make it nice gradual process. And that way we can get long plenty of stocks along the way. Rusty remains a pain in the butt talks, multiple bottoms, if you want to call it that, uh, kind of a complex head and shoulder type of deal. There's your weekly chart for those keeping score. You can see it, just keeps, it seems to be finding support down toward these lows, but that in and of itself, the fact that it's going sideways is not a reason to buy it. Gold to commodity doing pretty good in here. Starting to see a setup or two. These stocks can be really, um, <laughs> there's no hope in trading, <laughs> Frenchie. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, gold in general, doing pretty good. This is gold to commodity. You can see Landry lights above the 30 EMA, uh, bow tie proper water to the upside, although we are losing a little bit of steam in here. I think it still looks pretty good longer term. We'll have to keep an eye on the situation. Energy is a little bit different story. You can see they bow tied to the downside. They've been wide and loose and choppy, but they do look like they could be in a little bit of trouble. I'm starting to see some short setting up. I'm not going after any of them, but maybe fairly soon I might be if they stay kind of weak like they have been. Metals and mining broke to multi-week lows, as you can see here today. So that's looking fairly ugly. Let's take a look at the euro. Euro, yeah, euro's coming in a little bit, so that means the dollar strong. And the dollar being strong means that commodity prices will go down because you can buy more commodities. So that might be what's happening there. Foods are looking pretty good, just off of all-time highs. It's hard for me to get excited about foods, though, unless it's time for dinner. <laughs> HV of nine, the overall market's like 15 right now, so a little bit too uh, too crazy there. M&C has been doing really well. Material construction, just off of all-time highs. Looking pretty good in here, down a smidge today. We could see some setups fairly soon. And the Holden Builders, I'm keeping an eye on those guys. Take a look at drugs, just off of all-time highs. So far, so good. Taking their own sweet time about getting back there, but looking okay. And then biotechnology, wide and loose and all over the place. 
but now it's trying to break out. Let's see if it can follow through to the upside and give a, get above this range, and then we'll be at one year plus highs fairly soon here. In fact, I think we're almost there now. We're certainly on calendar year high, so that's a good thing for that, thank goodness. What else is in here? Let's take a look at, I like to keep an eye on the semiconductors. I like the semiconductors to confirm what's happening in the underlying, in the overall market, I should say. And unfortunately, semiconductors have bow tied to the downside, but they're stuck at a range. I wouldn't rush out and short them, but I wouldn't buy them either until and unless we could break out of this range. I think that's pretty much it for the market. The bottom line is it can't seem to to fire on all eight cylinders. And I know there's a lot of people out there that, that are doing a lot of in-depth analysis and are claiming that the market isn't that healthy, but the NASDAQ's making new highs. I think I think that's important. And you know, maybe the, the leadership is narrow, I don't know. But that can change really quickly. And and that's where the stealthy bull market comes in. I think I used that term this morning in the in the market in a minute. And it's, I'm not don't label me bullish because you know me. If it if it we drop like a stone tomorrow, then I might get bearish pretty quick. But in general, things are improving, and I think we have a little bit of a stealthy bull market going on, but that it's like the harder you look, then it's like, well, Dave, why aren't the city semis doing better? It's like, I don't know. It's like we can't seem to get the market to fire on all eight cylinders. All right. <laughs> I'm going to try to make a joke, but I guess it doesn't work. As I say, it's like trying to get a Jaguar to fire on all 12 cylinders or one cylinder for that matter. All right. Uh, any individual stocks you guys want to talk about? SLRN for Mr. John. John, have you been seeing any IPOs lately? I haven't really seen anything to, to get me too excited. There's a, a crypto one that's a stock, but it's performing poorly. What do you want to do with this, John? Did you type in? Oh, I typed in the wrong signal. I was about to say, I know you bet in that. SLRN. Where is it? SLRN. It's not coming up on my screen. Let's see something here. I wonder if I can get it in uh, trading view. SLRN. Uh, Nope, I can't get it to come up. Is that an IPO? Let me try stock charts. Oh, you're looking at TC? Well, you probably you probably rebooted it. Yeah, I don't reboot for like a week at a time. So I need to start doing that. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I see it. Let's see. One, two, three. Yeah, I can't get my analysis in. It looks like that was, um, I see that one slipped through the cracks. So technically, that would be a buy at B today. Your range isn't there, though. It doesn't really have a um, fantastic range. Um, you know, we'll see if we can get that back up. So let me just show. Um, stock charts. Okay, this is what I talk about with the range. Now I need to see if I can get rid of this. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Let's just do five bars. Let's take it off a log. And I just want five days. Let's see if this does it. Stock chart shows you the pre price, which kind of messes things up. Um, do you know what they do? Is there, there a story or something? So the range could be. Um, the range looks like it's a little low on this one. It's about three points range. I'd like to see a little bit more range for a buy at B. Now, yeah, you're one day later in the buy at B. The buy at B, uh, who was asking? Brian was asking about entries. So buy at B would have been on a close of 25.37 on this one. Now, sometimes, and I hate to say this, but let's say this thing had really good range and you you didn't notice it until you were doing your nightly analysis. Sometimes you can go in if you have good range and volume, you could buy these things in after hours. Biotech, okay. So if it's biotech, it's possible it could have a story. But yeah, I'd like to see a little bit more range. 
but yeah, that needs to be on my radar. So I'm I'm so glad you brought this up because obviously I need to I need to make sure that I am uh, if if you have to restart PC to get the new data, TC, I need to start doing that. Okay. So yeah, I would just without having more charts to look at, just off the top of my head, I would pass on that one for now. But I would definitely be all over it and put it in my watch list and let's see how it shakes out maybe if it drops significantly and the range increases and then re-triggers it might be a, a decent looking buy it be set up or if it rallies and then pulls back trade that first pullback now again i don't know what the volume and everything else is i i use different tools for my analysis and i like to kind of run it through more than one program to see but yeah there's something there i'm glad you brought it up so uh, I'll give you a high five on that. Range can be better. I agree with you on that. But other than that, it looks pretty good. All right. Any anybody else? USGO Gold plus IPO. Okay. USGO. Yeah. Now this one is interesting. And the frustrating thing with this one was your buy at B would have been right there. Okay. So the first day was the high for the week okay and i think the range was a little narrow too i did see this thing and i was like wow it's so darn thin okay and let's see 60,000 100,000 60,000 just no volume in it whatsoever so it's it's a buy at b it, you would have bought right there and you know, of course, it took off, but that's a little frustrating. Uh, but maybe as the volume increases on this a little bit, who brought this up? I'm glad you did, Jeff. On a pullback, it might be worthwhile, but this is definitely in my IPO list. You just sat there. Yeah, it just kind of went sideways for a while and then it took off. But that's a that's a thing about the buy at B, is you get these uh stealthy stealthy move sometimes well this was not so stealthy it's pretty obvious let's see bar one high for the week okay one two three four five the buy would be any close above this high here okay so there that would have been your entry right there unfortunately it was just way too thin to trade so that's a that's kind of a bummer but then you know it's encouraging in that, hey, there's some merit to this pattern. It can work really nicely. And if it doesn't work, you stop out. Who cares? You drop an F-bomb, move on. But unfortunately, it's frustrating when you've got something that's uh, that doesn't set up just right because it's too thin to buy or whatever the case may be. Uh, what was that one? Is it uh, B-I-T-D? Bit deer. Okay. This is the one. And it's not doing anything just yet. This is why we don't buy the first day, right? Okay, that's the first rule of IPOs. What's the first rule of IPOs? Don't talk about IPOs. No, no, that's my club. Uh, IPOs, first rule of IPOs, don't buy them until at least day five. Don't buy them unless they go up. Okay, so buy at B would have been right here, except we have the first bar rule. Okay, if the first bar sets the high for the week, and I know everybody here knows this, I just want to say it because I'm going to get a lot of questions from YouTube. If not, if the first bar sets a high of the first week of trading, then it has to close above that high. So I would recommend buying the stock at 970. It's kind of crazy, huh? To wait for it to get all the way back up there, but that's what the system or the pattern at least calls for. And so far, it's failed miserably. And again, this is a testament to why we wait until at least day five and why we buy on strength all right anything else going once going twice well obviously i want to thank all you guys and girls for attending i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule if you're following the service hang in there we're getting closer and closer to some big winners and the market's improving as a general statement so i think i think we're getting close but uh one day at a time as i preach if uh you're not in the Facebook group. Have a good weekend. I'm sure I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. I appreciate you again attending live tonight. And I think that's it. And may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.